Hello everyone. From time to time on my blog or on Twitter, I post about how sometimes I make prints using the cyanotype process. And I know a number of you have been curious about how that works. And it just so happens that I'm making some this weekend, so I thought I'd bring you along and show you how the process goes. Okay, so if we're gonna talk about how to make a cyanotype print like this one, let's start with the paper. And here is a pack of the paper that I'm using right now. This comes from the Awagami factory in Japan, and it's a material called Kozo. So Kozo is a Japanese mulberry fiber, and I've got a sheet of this stuff that I've already pulled out of the pack. It's a hand-laid paper, and if I bring it up close, you can kind of get a sense of what kind of texture it has. And I know the camera doesn't focus super well close up, but it's maybe enough to give you a little bit of a sense of what's going on here. I love how varied it is and how textured. It's also pretty delicate, which is something that I like about it. You know, you can see if I drag it over the edge of the pack of the paper, you can see how translucent it is. But it's pretty strong. And importantly for our process, it's got a lot of wet strength. And that's important for cyanotype because we're going to soak this in water twice. So it's got to be able to hold up. So it's got some technical advantages. But I also just really like how it feels and how it looks and how it's strong but delicate and soft and supple and... The way that, you know, if you're getting close on a print like this, you can see these waves and crests and little wrinkles, and it's got just a really nice organic feeling to it. Now, once I've got my paper on the pack here, the next step is I've got to coat it with a cyanotype solution, some chemicals that are going to let me develop an image on it. And for that, I would bring it into the kitchen. And down here in the kitchen is where I keep the chemicals in this little cabinet. And there's two chemicals that we're interested in that I keep in here. Got some potassium ferrocyanide and some ferric ammonium citrate. And I keep them in here because this one in particular is sensitive to UV light, so I just wanna make sure it's stored in the dark so it doesn't degrade over time. Uh, you can also see that I used to store some other cyanotype stuff in here, so there's all kinds of blue stains everywhere. That's just kind of part of doing the cyanotype process. You get blue stains on a lot of things. I should mention that these chemicals are fairly safe to be around. They're safe to keep in your kitchen or bathroom or over, wherever you want to put them. Um, really, I'm just generally more concerned about the potential mess and making sure things are cleaned up before they stain than I am about any kind of potential toxicity, because that's not really an issue. So... Let me get them out of here and put them on the table and I'll open up and show you what's inside. And thanks to the magic of video editing, here are the two chemicals opened. I needed both hands to do it so I couldn't hold the phone at the same time. I really like the, uh, the sort of orangey reddish color of the uh, potassium ferrocyanide. It's pretty cool. What I do is I take these two uh, chemicals and I mix them up with some water to create a cyanotype sensitizer solution. And that solution is a sort of yellow-green color. And right now I'm coating some on this piece of Kozo using this little sort of little mini paint roller thing. And what I would do is coat this entire sheet. And I've got a sort of beaker of more of the solution right over here to continue refilling the roller. Right now this uh, sheet of Kozo is just sitting on a piece of glass you can't quite tell, I mean, it's clear, but it's on a piece of glass, and that piece of glass is on a piece of cardboard. The reason I'm using this glass here is just because I want to put this sheet on something that won't absorb. I want to make sure that all of the cyanotype solution goes into the Kozo. It doesn't go into anything else that might be underneath it, and the glass isn't going to absorb any, and the glass will be easy to clean up afterwards. Uh, and then the cardboard is here just in case there's any spills or anything sort of flowing over the edge, which you, know, you can kind of see here that I've, I've definitely done in a number of places. You can see all these kind of stains underneath on the cardboard. That happens. That's part of the process. Now, once I've got this sheet, you know, completely covered here and it's all full of the cyanotype solution and soaked through. Remember I mentioned wet strength is important. This is the first time that we're going to soak this thing completely through in the process. And there's going to be one more that happens later on down the line. Once I've got this thing soaked through with the solution, I then bring it over here into the bathroom. And in my shower, I hang it up to dry. And I just stick it to the shower wall. And the reason I'm doing that is because 
I want to make sure if there's any excess liquid in there, it's got a place to drip down. And the shower is going to be easy to clean up with any excess, you know, any excess uh, cyanotype solution. I can wipe this down later on once I pull these off the wall. So I just need to give them a nice, compare, flat, easy to uh, clean place that I can let them dry at least part way. But they don't need to stay up there the whole time. Eventually they're going to start drying enough that they pull away from the wall. And when that happens, I'm going to move them to a different place. And that place is here. This is my bedroom closet. You can see I've kind of shoved everything off to the side here to make some room on the floor for these things. And what I've got them sitting on right now are just some old furnace air filters that I had sitting around. And I'm using those just because I want to have a layer between the paper and the floor. Again, I don't want things to stain or to you know, chemicals to get everywhere. Uh, so these are just something I can easily discard later. Plus, they allow a little bit of airflow for these things to dry more thoroughly and quickly. Uh, and they're actually already starting to do that now. You can see the brownish tan color near the top. And the reason for that is uh, these were sitting up in the shower and that was the part that was on top. And gravity was pulling the liquid down through the bottom. So they're a little bit more wet uh, toward the bottom side. I am going to leave them here overnight to finish drying and the reason I've chosen this location of my bedroom closet is because this is the largest room in my apartment that doesn't have any windows and that's pretty important because tonight once I finish getting all the rest of them in here what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the door. And I'm going to leave them there overnight to dry. The cyanotype solution that I've put on those papers is very sensitive to UV light, so I need to make sure that there's no chance of any sunlight getting in. That's why things are in the closet. The ordinary overhead lights that you see behind me, they're not really a problem. They don't really emit any UV to speak of, certainly not enough to cause any particular problems with what I'm doing, but sunlight would be bad. So that's why I'm actually doing this entire preparation step at night. Uh, there are windows in my kitchen, for example. I wouldn't want any sunlight coming through, so that's why I'm doing this at 9 o'clock. Uh, but I'm done with the preparation step now, so pretty much now it's just waiting for those things to dry before I can use them tomorrow. Good morning. It's the next day, and as you can perhaps tell from the windows behind me, it's sunny outside, so it's time to make some prints. Doesn't look particularly sunny here inside my bedroom, but that's just because I've got this big green blanket hung up over the window. And again, that's just because this is a UV sensitive process, so I want to keep that sunlight out. And in this case, this is acting in lieu of a curtain, because maybe you can tell my actual window curtains are trapped behind this uh, window insulation film that I use to keep out the Wisconsin winters. So the blanket's going to have to do. Now that I've got the light blocked, though, it's time to head on over to the closet and see how our papers turned out. And here they are. They've had quite a while to dry overnight, and the uh, chemicals that we put on them turned to this sort of, you know, brownish, maybe greenish almost color as they uh, dried overnight. And these things are ready to go. So I'm just going to grab one here and bring it on over to my prep station, which is just uh, on top of my bed. It's a couple of sheets of glass, and those sheets of glass are hanging out on uh, pieces of cardboard so that I can handle them more easily. And I'm gonna put this paper on top of one of the pieces of glass. And then on top of the paper, I'm gonna put this thing. Uh, this is a map that I had printed on some clear plastic film. Uh, I designed this map myself in Adobe Illustrator, which is where I do most of my cartographic design work. And then I just went on the internet and sent a file to a company and they printed it on this for me and mailed it to me. And I'm going to take this thing and I'm going to put it on top. And, you know, I'll get it roughly lined up and we'll, we'll make that a little bit more precise later. But I just want you to see how that image is going to end up in the center. What this thing is going to do, this piece of plastic, is going to, it's going to act as a negative. So, as I mentioned uh, several times, right, way too many times probably by now, is that 
this is a UV sensitive process. So I'm going to take this outside pretty soon and UV light from the sun is going to hit certain parts of this paper and it's going to be blocked from certain other parts where we've got the black ink on the film. So this is going to control what areas get exposed to the sun and which don't. Uh, what happens when UV light hits this paper is that it reacts with the chemicals that are inside. And we don't need to go into the details of how that works. I will uh, link to you a video that describes this in more chemical detail if you want to take a deep dive. But for our purposes, we'll just say that a chemical reaction happens when you, when you hit this with UV light. And this area is eventually going to turn blue, and these areas that are blocked are eventually going to end up white. So that's what this thing is controlling. The next step for me is to get this all lined up nicely. Maybe you can see here I've got some black lines along the edge, and those are just to uh, help me line this up perfectly and get it nicely centered. So I'm going to center the negative on top of the paper, and I'm going to center the paper on the glass, and then I'm going to put this second piece of glass on top of it and get it all sort of set up nicely in a sandwich. So I've got to put the phone down to do that, so I'll be back with you in a moment. All right, and with that, we've got everything sandwiched up and we're ready to go. Uh, as you can see here, I've got a bottom sheet of glass, and then I've got my paper, and then I've got my negative on top, and then I've got my top sheet of glass. And then I've just got that uh, taped together on three sides, a little bit of blue painter's tape, just to keep things from shifting around, to keep it pretty solid. Now, the reason I've got glass on the bottom is uh, something you might be wondering about. Glass on top makes sense. You gotta let the light come in. But the glass on the bottom, that's not really necessary. We don't need any light coming in through that side. But I've picked that because, well, one, I had several sheets of glass available to me, so it was handy material. But two, the glass is inflexible and, importantly, it's flat. So what that's going to do is help make sure that the negative stays very tight to the paper. We don't want any gaps there, no matter how small, because that could start to cause some blurring of our image or some potential shifting or other unwanted effects. So we want to make sure that these things are really tight together. And having a really you know, a hard and flexible material that's very flat, like glass underneath, helps make sure that's possible. So now that I've got this all set up, uh, I just need to take this piece of cardboard drop it on top and now everything is uh, blocked from the sun. I've got this cardboard on the front and I've got the other piece of cardboard on the back and both these pieces are going to make this whole thing easy to handle but it's also going to keep the sunlight out. So now I can take this outside and no light's going to get in until I've got it in position and I'm then going to pull the sheet of cardboard off the front and start letting the sunlight in when I've got it where I want it. So let's head outside. All right, so now we're outside at a tree in my yard, and I'm actually overdubbing this audio from indoors because the wind was just way too loud to be able to hear. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm just gonna pull the cardboard off the front and expose this thing to the sun. And you can see it starts out with the original color that we had inside, which looked a little bit more yellow just because of the sunlight. But even after a few seconds, you can start to see it turn green. And over the next, you know, 10, 20 seconds or so, it's going to start to transition into a blue color. Now, I've got this thing facing directly into the sun, and I'm using this tree shadow, which I'm showing you here, as my guide, just to make sure this thing is pointing directly into the sun's rays. And that's important because I want to make sure, well, first I need to make sure that the wind doesn't blow this uh, piece of cardboard out of my hands. And I'm just going to stomp that down there. But anyway, I want to make sure that the sun's rays don't come in at some sort of angle like this, but straight on like this, like I'm showing you here. Because I've noticed that if they come in at some sort of angle, you tend to get various bits of blurring and other problems in your print for whatever reason. So I just want to make sure this thing faces directly into the sun. Now by this point, you've seen how it's already turned blue. And if I let this sit out in the sun more, it's going to start to turn to a grayish, almost silver blue. And beyond that, it's going to start to turn into a sort of uh, copper or bronzy blue. The farther I let it go, the darker the overall print will end up. And for what I'm going for, I'm going to stop this when it gets to sort of a silver blue stage. That's going to take a few minutes. The amount of time that it takes actually varies quite a bit based on cloud cover, how high the sun is in the sky, what time of year it is. A lot of things like that impact the amount of UV that's coming out of the sun. 
But in any case, to get this where I want, it's going to take a few more minutes. So I'm going to pause the video here and we'll come back in a few minutes when it's at that stage. And this time we'll be back with the live audio because it will still be windy, but not so bad that you can't hear me. All right, we're back several minutes later and you can see it's changed a fair bit. It's got this sort of grayish cast to it. And, uh, you know, again, this, this could continue to go farther. I could let it uh, keep getting stronger in its exposure to the sun. And that will end up with a much stronger blue color when we're finally done. But I think this is, this is pretty good. And it only took, I don't know, maybe a total of five or six minutes, which is not too bad. Uh, sometimes these things can take a real long time depending on the time of year and the amount of cloud cover. But this one was fairly quick. So I've just got to pick up the cover here, let it blow around in the, in the wind a little bit. There we go. And pack this up and bring it inside. Okay, so I brought everything back inside and taken it apart. And now we can see what our paper looks like after it's been exposed to the sun. And you can see a lot of it is bluish gray, but there's also some white areas here where uh, the light was blocked, but it also doesn't seem like there's enough of them. You know, when you look over here at the negative, there's all kinds of black ink everywhere, but it doesn't seem like there's enough corresponding white areas on our image. But if I get in close here, you might be able to see that there's some dark blue spots like along here, and those correspond also to the parts of our negative that blocked the sun. Anything that's dark blue is going to turn white in our final image. It's really only this sort of um, silvery blue color that's going to turn dark blue in our final print. Everything else is going to be white. And if that doesn't make sense to you, don't worry, just stick around a few minutes. You'll see what I mean when I finish this thing. So how do we finish it? Well, we've got to develop it. Uh, I mentioned before that sunlight is coming in and making a change on these papers. We put two chemicals on the paper, right? So what happened is the sunlight came in and changed one of them, and now it wants to react with the other one. But in order to make that reaction happen, this paper has to get wet so those chemicals can float around, and then they're going to combine, and then they're going to make a pigment called Prussian blue. So all I've got to do is take this thing, bring it over here into the bathroom, and soak it in some water. And I've got my bathtub already full, so now we're going to do the cool thing. I'm going to soak this in water, and it's going to be amazing, and this is definitely my favorite part of the process. So here we go. Isn't that cool? Look at that. The image just shows right up. It's pretty awesome. And I just kind of push this around a little bit, kind of get all the excess chemicals that didn't react get all those to come off the paper and into the water. And you can kind of see that there's a, a greenish, bluish stuff coming out. And that's all perfectly safe to put down the drain. But I just need to get all those excess chemicals off here. So I'm going to wash this for a few minutes and maybe take it through a couple of changes of water. And then we'll see how it turns out. And here it is, all washed and drying on my shower wall. And much like last night when I had the sensitizer chemicals on the paper, I'm just leaving it there to drip dry for a little bit, just on a place that I can clean easily and I don't have to worry about any extra chemicals coming off or staining things. After a little while, uh, it'll dry enough that I'm going to move it to maybe a piece of cardboard or some other flat place where it can finish drying for the rest of the day. This is not the color that the final image is going to have. Here, I've got one that I made yesterday, and I've given it 24 hours to both dry and for the reaction to finish in the chemicals. And this is really what it's going to look like in the end. So this thing is going to take a little bit of time to really come to its sort of uh, full, rich, dark blue color. But otherwise, it's pretty much done. It's mostly just a waiting game at this point. So that's the cyanotype process. Uh, thanks for coming along, and I hope you enjoyed it or learned something or were entertained or whatever. But I'll catch you all next time. And if you've stuck around this far, here's some bonus content, me developing another print. It's just so cool, I thought you should see it again. Isn't that neat?